This interview is brought to you by Fortuna Silver Mines, proven mine builders and strong operators in Peru and Mexico. Welcome to Cambridge House Live. I'm Vanessa Collette at the Toronto Resource Investment Conference. Today I'm joined by Tacoa De Silva, publisher of bullmarketthinking.com. Welcome Tacoa, great to have you here with us. Hi Vanessa, thanks for having me. Tacoa, what do you make of the recent movements we've seen in gold? Well, it's been pretty fascinating. Uh, it has been, uh, it's been falling apart price-wise when you look at it on a chart all throughout 2013. But what's really interesting, and anyone who's visited my site of Bull Market Thinking, the interview guests and so forth, people there, is that there are some interesting things going on with the fundamentals. I spoke with a technical trader, uh, one of my favorites, Gary Savage, yesterday, and he mentioned that the fundamentals, um, they're falling apart. And he means that from the supply side, in terms of we're seeing uh, the physical bullion of the West uh, being packed up and, and shipped to Asia uh, from the shipping desks. I spoke with one person and he noted that the, the GLD is boxing up its, its physical gold and shipping it directly to, to Asia from its trading desks. And so it's fascinating when you, when you see the, the mismatch there, you know that, that something is afoot, uh, there's something happening. And uh, so the assets, uh, they're certainly moving. So is that what you think has been causing all of the action we've seen over the last several months? Uh, in terms of the price action? Mm -hmm. Well, I put myself in the shoes of being one of those top fund traders or investors. And, you know, when you look at the marketplace, there are some people that go out and they build companies and they grow things. They, they, they are the farmers, so to speak. They go out and plant seed every day. And then you have others that they are the pillagers. They are the fighters. They go out with um, their... their their cavalry, their command of ships, so to speak, and they go out to destroy, uh, destroy prices and seize those assets. And, you know, there's something that I've spoken about in one of my um, commentaries is uh, there's nothing, uh, I don't think there's anything uh, um, legally uh, against um, spending some money to change sentiment in the news marketplace. I think that's something that happens. And we look at analysis that comes out from banks and, and, and funds and then commentary we see on mainstream news sources. All that's part of the part of the scene. And, uh, and so I, I think it needs to be carefully considered everything before you reach a conclusion uh, on anything. So do you consider yourself more of a technical trader than a fundamental trader? I know you mentioned your, you follow some technical analysis. Sure. I don't consider myself a technical trader. I would say uh, I'm more of a fundamental uh, believer. Uh, my skills with trading and investing aren't very uh, sophisticated. They're not very um, advanced. I, I guess my ability and my approach is to look to people who are much smarter than I am and go to them for guidance and, um, and, and seek their wisdom and speak with them. And, and then if they have the track record, if they have the success that's been proven and shown and demonstrated in the marketplace, then I say, okay, let's, let's get to know each other more here and over the next number of years, invest together and, and do some things together. So that's, I guess, what my approach is to answer your question. Well, you talk to a lot of the big players in the industry, you do a lot of interviews. You know, what's the consensus from these guys over the last interviews that you've been doing? I guess getting back to your, uh, the first question about, and talking about the mismatch between the, what's going on in prices and what's going on in terms of the mm -hmm. physical supply out there in the market, they are of a similar opinion. You talk to, to people like the great mine builder, Rob McEwen, uh, who is the founder of Gold Corp and now the head of McEwen Mining. And he says, uh, in, to paraphrase him, that this doesn't make sense. It's crazy the way prices are. And you had Eric Sprott up here earlier speaking to him and, and people who follow his commentary know that he certainly agrees and expects an explosive uh, move or a, a change to occur, at so, to occur at some point. So I guess it's just waiting for the catalyst, whatever it might be, and I think being excited about this time because we still have the opportunity that, thank God gold's not at $2,000 an ounce or higher because the opportunity will have been further extracted and uh, it, wouldn't, yeah, it wouldn't be here. That's a very optimistic way of looking at it. It's very bull market thinking. There's a lot of skepticism out there and talk of bear markets for gold and slowing growth in China and India. What's your reaction to that? Bear markets for gold. Well, um, I think that gold is 
sort of at the bottom. Maybe it's emerging out of a period like we saw in the mid-70s, from 1974 to 1976, where the price of gold collapsed just about 50%. Now, I published a chart on my website um, illustrating, uh, I guess, uh, again, the opportunity here from an optimistic standpoint of uh, two different types of markets. A market that starts, uh, let's say, at $1,000 of gold, has a 30% correction, and then recovers to $1,000 per ounce. In that type of market, a person that has a disciplined accumulation program makes more money than in a market where you have a steady increase on a monthly basis. So for example, if you compare a corrective market to sort of like a bull market, let's say at 2% every single month, you make less money accumulating on a monthly basis in those bull markets than you do in the corrective markets. And I mean, most people listening, they're probably much like you and me, they're just regular people where they have income and they need to buy on a regular basis. So again, I, I think that we're in a pretty up, uh, uh, we're in a place here for great opportunity, I think. Lee, I mean, you've said that it's actually better to continue buying as prices drop and then recover than, you know, rather than continuing just to buy during a bull market. So I guess that's similar to what you're saying there. There's more upside in that way. Yeah, I agree. You have some of the, the most successful uh, accomplished investors on the planet doing, doing it that way. You have, for example, Ned Goodman of uh, Dundee Corp. He's mentioned that he goes out and buys a gold stock every single day and he speaks about the gold stocks that he's buying. And you look at the Indians, you look at the Chinese, what they do, they're allocating or they're putting aside 30 to 40 percent of their incomes into physical gold and silver bullion. And whenever they get bonuses, they, they, they put that right into the metal and they, and they sock it away. Uh, so what's going to happen in, in 10 to 20 years as, as essentially they, they have all that gold and it gets revalued and and their middle class is in possession of that. What's the world going to look like? So I, I think it's, it's fascinating to think about. We can take lessons from ancient history as well. And I know that you're a big fan of the book, The Richest Man in Babylon. Why is that? Well, thank you for asking about that. I brought this copy, uh, my traveling copy of The Richest Man in Babylon. Such a, an amazing, fantastic book. I purchased this for probably a dollar or two uh, as a used copy. And anyone can do this. And when I first read this, I thought, wow, it's just you know, another financial book and it talks about lessons. I, I think it's in um, Babylon, it takes place in the, the ancient, I call it the, the Middle East, I, I guess you could say. And when I first read this, as I said, I, I thought, oh, it's just another financial book. But after having done hundreds of interviews in this space, uh, in the precious metals, the mining space, with the CEOs, the fund managers, and then coming back to this book again and reading it a few years later, I, 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 just sitting down and reading this, it's like having a conversation with one of, again, the greats in the business where, you know, Rick Rule has mentioned that uh, in this run-up that we had in 2010 and early 2011 in the mining shares that you had all the, the butchers, the bakers, and the candlestick makers coming into the, the mining business and, and running companies and asking investors for money. And that's spoken about in this book where you had a, a young man who gave uh, his money, his savings to... Um, a mason uh, and what the mason did was went out and and he tried to buy jewels from what was the Phoenicians uh, people from a foreign country came back and realized he had no idea what he was doing and he lost all his money because he didn't have skills in the jewelry business right and, and so that connects with something that Warren Buffett is known for saying that if you don't know jewels know your jeweler um, right. and so just basic principles of discipline time hard work and thrift are discussed in this book and I think it's a, a must-have for anyone that's looking at this sector so is that your philosophy your guiding philosophy? You know, I had to learn the hard way. I, I, I failed again and again and again and again, over and over and over again, um, until you you start to see the trends and, and you, you share your story and you listen to other people's stories. Again, the most successful people in the world. And then you come back to a classic like this and everything makes sense after you go through that process. So hopefully people watching can be s smarter than myself and not have to go through all the stumbling blocks and the failures in order to reach that that place for themselves. Absolutely. Well, we're here at a resource conference, so I'd like to ask you specifically about some of the companies maybe that you like. What are you looking for? What are you investing in? Um, sure. Can you share a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, in, to reconnect with one of your earlier questions in terms of perspective and looking at the space, um, or skilled skill source rather, I look for great people. I look for people that are entrepreneurial, that have outstanding track records um, that come from uh, great families that really know what they're doing. And looking at the space, I I've concluded that there's about 20 people on the planet that are just the best 
the best, again, on the planet uh, in this mining space. And um, I had the chance to sit down next to Jorge Ganosa. Uh, he's the, the co-founder um, and he's the, the head of Fortuna Silver Mines. And I had a chance to tour their uh, San Jose mine, which they're uh, increasing their uh, production capacity on to 1,800 tons per day. I had the chance to sit next to him and learn about his background, fourth generation miner. As a child wow. growing up, yeah, he would, he would spend all year around at the mining camps with his family, learning hands-on. And then as he got a little bit older, uh, he would go to school and then take a break during the summers and go back to, to the mining camps to learn. So how do you compete with someone who's been training, essentially, since they were five or six years old, right? right. And so he brought that skill set to Fortuna, and, and, and he has a, another company that he's working on now with his brother, Atiko Mining, I believe I've the name is. Yeah. And so uh, you can see his experience, his work, uh, illus uh, uh, sort of embodied in Fortuna Silver Mines. The company is making lots of money. They've got up close to 90 million in cash and credit facilities that they have available for acquisitions, and they've activated their, their acquisition. I guess, program and strategy. So uh, it should be exciting to see where they go from here, especially having cash and growing cash levels coming out of this bear market. Well, just to wrap up, any final thoughts to share with us today, Takoa? Yes, actually, there's one more, uh, and that is a fantastic um, family and company that people can look towards, the Reeds uh, Gold Resource Corporation. I, I know we're, we're wrapping up here, but Bill Reed and Jason Reed, Jason's now the CEO and president of uh, Gold Resource Corporation. Look at them as people before you look at the company, and yeah. you'll find a fantastic story there as well. Absolutely. So thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today, Tako. It was a pleasure. Pleasure to be here, Vanessa. Thank you. Thank you.